Good morning, Wabash. Speaking today at Pioneer Chapel is Reverend Dr. Finley Campbell with his title talk, talk titled, Malcolm X in the Spirit of 1975, the Unity of General Lou Wallace and the 11th Indiana Volunteers, 1863, and Director Horace Turner of the Malcolm X Institute, 1971. Dr. Campbell is no stranger to Wabash. He was a founding faculty member of the Malcolm X Institute and a former professor of English at the college. He built a career around multiracial activism and militant protest. Dr. Campbell's activism inspired MXI students and their white colleagues to protest the college's decision to ask him to resign. The protest resulted successfully in a one-year extension of his contract as a fellow at the Institute. Dr. Campbell has a bachelor from Morehouse College and a Master of Arts from Atlanta University, and a Doctor of Philosophy from the University of Chicago in Anglo-American Literature. His academic career spanned nearly 30 years and included stops at Clark uh, Atlanta University, Morehouse College, Wabash College, the University of Wisconsin-Madison, the University of Illinois Chicago, and Chicago State University. Reverend Dr. Finley is an academic theologian and an ordained Baptist minister. His ministry is now committed to his role as a spokesman of the Utilitarian Universalist Association of Congregations and as the vice chair of the Neo-Racism Combating UUMUAC. Reverend Dr. Campbell's Community activism parallels the depth of his academic career. In 1968, it began with the Black Action Committee and later the International Committee Against Racism. He was also program coordinator of the Racial Justice Force of the Social Justice Council of the First Utilitarian Church of Chicago. Reverend Dr. Campbell also ran for Indiana Congress in the Democratic primary for the 7th District in 1970 and came in second, and for governor of Indiana in 1972, where he came in third. He considers Crawfordsville and Wabash College as the places where he was born again into the theo theology of social humanism. Please give a warm welcome to Reverend Dr. Finley Campbell. I cannot start a presentation, homily, sermon, without putting on my stole. And if I had room on my trunk for my travel, I would have brought my PhD robe. It's pretty spectacular. But instead, I will just, this is easier to do, and it, I hope I can do it right. Okay, just take it over here like this, and how does that look? Look okay? Uh -huh. <laughs> Malcolm X and the Spirit of 1975. The unity of General Lew Wallace of the 11th Indiana Volunteers, 1863, and my brother and director, Horace Turner of the Malcolm X Institute, 1971. I'm going to present a homily this morning for the 50th anniversary of the Malcolm X Institute of Black Studies, which some people thought would last maybe one or two or three years, and then it would disappear. <laughs> Any uh, members of the Institute here today, raise your hands, like what you look like. Any supporters of the Institute, raise your hands. Hey, 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 yeah, that's the dream come true. Still here, still viable, still doing what we need to do. In 1968, September, I spoke from this place for the first time after being vetted and investigated to make sure it was okay for me to become the first African-American, no, excuse me, black American to be full-time here at the Wabash College. I was being introduced to the whole place, and at that time, chapel was required. Isn't that amazing? 
Better get your ass in there. <laughs> You're not going to pass. <laughs> and I remember speaking of a war at that time. It was the Vietnam War. And we were trying to decide who to vote for. So I wanted to vote for uh, third party candidates. Some were Nixon supporters because he had promised to end the war. Some of us wanted to vote for Humphrey because at least he had promised once he was elected to end the war. Everybody was promising to end the war. Eventually the Vietnamese ended the war by winning, by winning. 1968 is now 1922. Uh, 20, uh, Another war is going on, but this time we don't have American boys fighting in Ukraine for Ukrainian boys. But let's hope it remains that way. I want to do a symbolic thing here, which is for me, not so much for you. I want to apologize to a brother named Tim Nichols. I want to apologize to another brother named David Britt. I don't want to apologize to Thad Seymour, who died recently, and who helped to create by supporting and allowing it to go forward the Malcolm X Institute of, at that time it was simply the Malcolm X Institute. It allowed me to be a part of the school when at the time I was on my way out the door without a job, without prospects, <laughs> and possibly without a place to stay. I also want to remember the two gentlemen, two, the three people that brought me here in the first place, and that was a guy named Victor Ransom, Preston Green, and of course, David Britt. Today, I think the Sphinx Club for taking a chance on a mysterious yet well-known individual, still somewhat crazy, to come and share with you what we're going to be talking about today the spirit of 1975. Prologue. In December 1964, Malcolm X, also known as Malcolm Little, and finally as Malik El Shabazz, the head of the revolutionary nationalist organization called the Organization of Afro-American Unity, met with Milton Rose, or Milt Rose, the chair of the Progressive Labor Party movement, this was in New York, to discuss the possibility of Malcolm running for mayor in an education campaign for mayor in New York City, calling for a variety of reforms, but mainly changing and reforming the New York Police Department. Now, now both knew that was going to be impossible to win the election. But with Malcolm as a running partner and Milt's group giving the door-to-door -door stuff, at least they could mobilize consciousness for the need for changing the police department because they just killed a guy, young kid, 12 years old. Isn't that interesting that history still goes on? The idea was that both messages Revolutionary Socialism, that was the PLM group, and Revolutionary Black Nationalism, that was the OOAU group, or the Organization of Afro-American Unity. In the course of the discussion, Milt asked Malcolm, Malcolm, how long do you think we're going to have to have two separate organizations? One white for the white radicals mainly, and one black for the black, black radicals only. And according to the legend, Malik is supposed to have said humorously, he says, well, by 1975, white folks would have gotten rid of their white supremacy complex, and black people would have gotten rid of their racial inferiority complex. And <laughs> amazingly, and I was there in Boston, in 1975, at one of Malcolm's hometowns, Boston, I witnessed in 1975 this new unity, multiracial unity, when we took on the racists in Boston. This is before your time, and many of you, when they were tearing that city up to prevent integrated education. Integrated education. 
I referenced General Lewis at the beginning of my homily because he was a major player in the great abolitionist war. How many of you have ever heard of the great abolitionist war? Mm-hmm. Who's in charge of the history department here? <laughs> All right, tell him, send him this message. In 1863, the Civil War, the war against secession, the... Are you listening? That war got changed by Abraham Lincoln because on January 1st of 1863, he signed a document called the Emancipation Proclamation. And at that moment, it became the great abolitionist war. Now let me say this quick, quick, quick. This is for you history majors here. When the head of the Confederacy heard of this, he said, okay, we're gonna win the war now. Head of the Confederacy, Jeff Davis. He said, Lincoln has, dis has destroyed his chances to win the war because what white man would kill other white men to set the coloreds free. And to prove their point, they decided to invade the North at a place called Gettysburg. And they were sure they were going to win. Because what? What white man would kill another white man to set the coloreds free? I would not tell you what happened. So the great abolitionist war, whose victory laid the basis for the liberation of the Union from the white supremacist forces of the slaveocracy, called in the history books Confederacy. I bet you never heard of that name before, history majors. Slaveocracy. Oh, no, it's the Confederate States of America. Don't, don't talk about that slavery stuff. <coughs> Hundred years later, as a result of that victory, first over there and now over here, Malcolm X Institute of Black Studies in the middle of Crawfordsville, Indiana, at a little old white old male school called Wabash College. <laughs> How many more minutes do I have? All right, thank you. When you, when you bring ex-Baptists who are now Unitarian, Universalists, social humanists, and all that other stuff, you, you might be, lock the door, don't let anybody out. <laughs> this then is the conceptual background to my homily this morning, dealing with the spirit of 1975, which I saw reflected at my supper with him ex-brothers on Wednesday evening. I saw a white brother was there, a black brother was there, I think it was a Hispanic type brother. His name was Marco or something like that. Oh, the point was the unity of light and dark skinned people. You know, that's all we got. Real quick, put your hands out like that. Turn them over like that. You're dark or on, dark on white on one side, but everybody's light on the inside. So ain't that all it is. Unity of light and dark skinned people. Because we got all these names of this race and this race, that's just stuff. I want to discuss, however, in the time that's remaining, my experiences with the Malcolm X Institute. I will cover three points in my work. First, with the feasibility study group, consisting of Joe O'Rourke, I think he's passed, Bert Stern, I think he's still alive, and myself. Then I wanted to describe a little bit of how I got involved with the Institute. And in the end, I will describe what I learned from that experience. Let's start with the first point. At the time, I was a relatively respected member of the faculty. <laughs> I got a little disrespected later, but at that time, I was a respected <laughs> member of the faculty. And I was selected by Bert to join with him and Joe in driving a dilapidated open convertible to go check out some black studies programs, one at ISU, one at IU Bloomington, 
and one at DePaul right down the street. Does DePaul still exist, by the way? <laughs> I didn't come here to start no mess now. <laughs> the Black Panther Party, of which I was a acting member of Minister of Education, they argued that black studies programs should focus on, are you listening, science and technology, law and medicine, and social psychology and community organizing from a black perspective, what I would call a black humanist, humanist perspective. This would be done in order to train black students to take part in the Panthers' community control program. Whatever well, you may have heard about the Black Panther Party and the, the gun, the guns were secondary, the program was primary. And what they wanted was to train these black students to be like cadre in law, people's law offices, in medicine, people's hospitals, they had this idea, what is a hospital but a clean room without any bacteria and somebody knowing some medicine and they compared it the way in which U.S. Medical Corps guys could do stuff on the battlefield or what the Viet Cong was doing with its movement. They wanted to train students as a part of their community control program. Quote, you can't control a community with ignorant people. You gotta have some knowledge, and the knowledge gotta be practical, and we're living, he, they said, uh, his name was Donald Campbell, he's our leader at the time, you gotta be credentialed. We don't want any, he used to call it half-stepping, we don't want any half-stepping. We want people to know what they are doing when they go into a court to defend somebody who's a victim of police brutality, know the law, and use it against those who are seeking to control us. That was the plan. There was another group called the Cultural Naturalists. Nationalists. They argued that the purpose of, they called it Afro-American studies, was to deal with culture, literature, expressive media, learn Swahili, learn about music, dance, art, Afrocentrism. My position was that our Black Studies program should be within the liberal arts tradition of Wabash College, but bringing in a black perspective. Finding the black connections, what's your major? Finding the black connections in PPE. Sound like you're going to the bathroom. Fraud! Excuse me, I'm sorry, that slipped out. Finding the black perspective in PPE. And if you, and, and, and using existing courses. Anybody taking a course in or, organic, something, another, biochemical, biological stuff? What's the black connection there? Finding that black connection, bringing it out, and if you didn't have a connection you could find, then bringing in new courses ex in existing departments. Bringing in new courses in existing departments. For example, in the classics department, the role of African mythology through Egypt on Greek mythology. Or the courses, I had two courses I taught in the Department of English. At the time, I did not see the Institute as being a parallel collection of courses, but rather to be a supplement to the existing educational program and strengthening the ability of our black students to survive and triumph over the rigors of being in a predominantly white, say predominantly white, liberal arts, say liberal arts, all male school, say all male school, with all of the peculiar contradictions located here in Crawfordsville, Indiana, say Crawfordsville, Indiana. <laughs> Whoa! Five, six, nine, twelve. You know, I, I, looking back on it, we were kind of crazy. Why would somebody from Indianapolis, Chicago, Memphis, Atlanta come to this place to, to get educated? Because we opened the door. We opened the door. And we will 
subsidize, supplement whatever is necessary because we at Wabash College recognize we could not be a truly liberal slash liberating institution without the presence of the most oppressed group at that time, black folks from the urban areas of <laughs> Illinois, Indiana, Indiana. Now let me tell you something. 71 was, it was heavy duty when we were founding this great institute of ours. A new culture was emerging called the desegregated culture. In Indiana has some pretty complicated history on that question. One of the biggest Klan organizations was not in Alabama, Mississippi, or Georgia. It was right here in Indiana. They controlled the governorship and, and, and the state this and many communities. Black people literally had to have a white patron to protect them from full oppressed conditions. But here we were, here at Wabash College, taking part in the creation of the desegregated culture. Now, you hear a lot today about white supremacy culture. I have to tell you some terrifying truth. This desegregated culture was on its way toward racial integrated culture, total, but the Vietnam War got in the way. Because it was going to take the kind of money they send into Ukraine now is the kind of money we would have needed then to have fully integrated the poor white with the poor black. Well, that's where the battleground was. These two poor people fighting over the scraps. Who's going to get the scraps? And so we, we gave the poor whites white privilege. We'll give you some white privilege while you're starving. We'll give you some white fragility while you can't feed your children. We'll give you some white supremacy to keep you shut up because you don't get good medical care. So we were in the forefront here at this school in helping to create the desegregated culture. And I think, I think, and I, I, I don't want to be idealistic, but I think we've crossed over to a racially integrated culture. Because certainly, come up here for a quick minute. So, cer certainly, <laughs> certainly something's going on. <laughs> something's going on. Sit out there. Something's going on. So that was the plan, and it, it, it took off. But the problem was we needed something. And we, if the institute was going to survive, we would needed to have a mechanism, a, a, a person or persons who would be working with these black students so they could survive here. Many of them had come out of segregated schools. Many of them had come out of segregated schools. We were getting them ready for this desegregated culture created by the Civil Rights Movement and our martyr, Brother King Jr. I had a class with him, by the way, in my youth. We on the one side with the black power activists. We don't want it. On the other side, the white power activists. We don't want it. And here we are in the middle. Well, we need it. We need it. So how to get them to survive? So it was going to be a supportive program. But we needed someone who would be willing to you know, a budget was limited. Budget was limited. It was an experiment. We only had a relatively handful of black students. Their names flow through my head. I'll talk about them in a minute. Who was going to do the job? I said, it ain't going to be me. It's not going to be me. I got other things I'm doing. I'm running for governor of the state of Indiana. I don't have time to be worried about some black students on this campus. And besides, I had been given a uh, request by either Dean Trainer or Dean Moore, uh, Finley, could you quietly resign? You're raising too much trouble. You're causing too much trouble. You're on television. You're attacking the war. You're attacking. Now, we don't mind you attacking the war. We don't mind you attacking Lyndon Baines Johnson. But for God's sake, why did you attack the Lilly Foundation? <laughs> 
All I said is, we don't want your free libraries, we want free insulin. <laughs> and that created a bit of a stir. <laughs> And, and, by, and then amazing, the insulin, insulin thing is back on the table. Oh, well. No, it ain't going to be me. Besides, uh, I promised I would quietly resign, and I did, and I was ready to get a job at Earlham College. Getting a job at, they had girls there. Getting a job at Earlham College. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I mean I, 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 throw that out of your mind. Hey, I'm this old man out here. Well, I go to get ready to go to Earlham College. I'm all set. Everybody says, oh, we want you. We love you. You're so great. You're, you're good. Unfortunately, they left out of the equation one person, the president of Earlham College. <laughs> he said, no way. We're not having this Black Panther pre-communist guy coming to our campus. And even though they had this idea of a democratic consensus, if one person didn't like uh, a decision, they could stop it. So he stopped it. So I came back, hat in hand, to the Department of English with Walter Furtick, was there at the time. And I said, <coughs> Walter, <coughs> coughing. Any way I could get my job back? <laughs> Any way I could get my job back? He said, well, we'll try. So they went and they talked with Thad Seymour. And Thad he, Seymour say those magic two letters, H-N. They remember what H-N stands for? Hell no. <laughs> we got him out of here. We don't want to see him come back. Well, I thought that was the end of it. But to use the old name, the Lord took over. Some students and some faculty members, mainly the students, Chuck Ransom, Lim Stigler, Doc McDowell and their white counterparts in the different fraternities. Tiki, what's your name of your fraternity? Grandma Kai. Grandma Kai, everybody, student body. I had a bit of a reputation of being a sort of an interesting teacher among a lot of different people. And they had a big meeting right in here. And everybody said, but you ain't going in there. We will handle this. We will handle this. All your rhetoric and all your intensity and all your emotionalism, we don't want to hear it. It's time for some critical thinking time. With some emotion, of course. So I'm standing out there like somebody waiting to pass an exam. <laughs> and they came out and said, okay, we got a deal. I hear it's pretty rambunctious, a lot of back and forth. This, this guy's destroying our college. He said he was leaving. Time check. Okay, and so they came out and Stiegler and Doc met with me. They said, we want to ask you one question. If we get this thing arranged, will you work for us? Now this is, you know, Mr. Ari, this is Dr. Campbell, PhD, University of Chicago. Some students asking me, will I work for them? You heard of HY? Hell yes. <laughs> <laughs> And so I became the first fellow. Uh, I met with Brother Turner, and he uh, laid out the, the rules from Monday to Friday, 9 to 5, you belong to, other, to the institute. After that, you're on your own. We shook our hands. He wrote me a little, I signed a letter. He gave a check for $12,000, because that was it. He said, I'm not going to be worried about every month getting you a check. Here's your $12,000. Now, whatever you do it, spend it all at once or spend it over a year, it's up to you. But this is it, $12,000. I put it in my Indiana Peace and Freedom Party account, and I went to work for the Institute. It was uh, amazing. I had to be, I, had, I already had some training in what is called uh, supportive education theory. So I had to help these, these brothers deal with the textbook, <laughs> the textbook. How many of you have had textbook-itis? Think about that big, you know? And you gotta go through it, get ready for a test. So I had to show them how to decode the textbook. Papers were being written. They had hardly understood the basic techniques of, they knew general writing, but academic writing was different. And the rule was, Campbell, you're not writing these papers. You are not writing these papers and let them be passed off as if they're bitten by the students. You are to show them how to write.
the papers. So if you were to drop dead tomorrow, they'd know how to do it. So how to kind of uncover how to do that. And I said, one of the easiest ways to write a paper, follow the teacher's instruction. If he says 15 pages covering this, this, and this, do exactly what he or she tells you to do. And with that framework, you can make this work. And last and most least, there's a lot of counseling. I don't see what I'm doing here. My friend's going to Morehouse. My friend's going to Clark. My friend's going to Fisk. They're having a good time down at Florida A&M State University. And here I am stuck up here. I say, yeah, but you're learning something they don't know how to learn. What's that? Working with white folks. <laughs> Working with white folks. <laughs> Learning, learning their ins and outs and discovering to your amazement they're human just like you. Neither superior or inferior, just students. Some of them will be arrogant. Some of them have a misguided notion of their authority and power, but you are learning to deal with a desegregated culture. And without that, you can't win. Time check. Give me a time check. Time check. Give me a time check. All right, then I'd like to bring a conclusion. What did I learn from all that? I learned that a good teacher learns from his or her students. I learned that it is not my job to make academic learning more complicated than it is, but to show how you too can master the art of academic education. My job was to show that your being here is a privilege. Therefore, don't be rejecting it by the pressure and the tension of being a handful of black folks in a largely white school. Go with the flow, embrace it. You're not over here to hide out in Malcolm X Institute. My job is to supplement what you're gonna be doing over there. You're going to be joining the fraternities, running for office, taking part in the plays, whatever is going on over there, you're going to be doing it too. So there's a lot of deprogramming I had to deal with. But I think we did it. Because in 1972, all those who stuck with the program graduated from this school. I don't want to get tearful, but I'm going to get tearful. It was amazing for me and for them. That one year for all of us was like a new booster. Gave us the energy, the insights, the learning of how we're going to make this thing work through multiracial unity. Horace and I Disagreeing on some things, but agreeing on one thing always, and he was always hard. I don't see why these black students don't do this, and I don't see why they don't do that. You know, he, 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 would, he was like Big Daddy. I was just a little, the little daddy. I was just a little daddy. But when it was over, class of 1972, there they are, S S Stiegler and Dockery, a guy named J.J. Uh, Jack Johnson, crazy guy. And we also communicated into the community. We also began to reach out into the, to the Crawfordsville community. We, we took part in some of the community things, some cleanups and worked with the high schools, particularly some of the black kids in the high school. It was incredible. I must close. The Lord moves us in different ways to do the work, and you are here to do the work. I wish I could promise you a golden time, but I think things are going to be a little bit rough. Here's a book I want everybody to read. The Devil Never Sleeps. Get that book. The devil never sleeps. Therefore, angels must always be on guard. And you're part of the angels. The fact that you showed up here to listen to this old guy is powerful. Brother Scott, thank you for your work and, your, and the power you're doing. Hope I got your name right. <laughs> John, thank you. Thanks, Steve Jones. Thank you, Brother Kim, for bringing me here. Thank you, my Sphinx brothers. Let me come up here. I leave you with this proposal. One of these Memorial Days, I want to see the Malcolm X Institute students, along with the other community of Wabash, 
go with a big flower wreath to the Union statue either in downtown Crawfordsville or at the cemetery and lay that wreath at the Union dead, saying thank you. Thank you for proving that Jeff Davis was a liar, that you were willing to kill white people in order to set the colors free, and we are grateful. And then you may want to go to Lou Wallace Museum and maybe have some kind of symposium on the question. How did the Crawfordsville people react to the Emancipation Proclamation? Did they say the magic, magic word, A-S? Oh, shit. Or did they go to the R-O? Right on! About time. It's freedom time, and you and the Wabash students that fought in the Union Army part of that process. Brothers, and I thank you for allowing me to be here. Be blessed in your labor, be blessed in your work. Asian, Latin, black, red, white, committed people, the angels must unite. Amen.